nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in a season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray one last time. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you would bless your word, bless your word to our hearing, penetrate our, our hearts with your word, that we may grow today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, it, it came upon me while, while uh, I was considering the sort of crowd you know you have around holiday Sundays, and it gets a little thin sometimes. Um, one thing, though, that's for sure, some folks are out and they're doing really meaningful stuff. Uh, but as, as you notice that people aren't, here on a Sunday and sometimes our folks travel a lot and they do stuff when they come back um, you know don't overwhelm or smother anybody but just say I love seeing you here I'm glad you're here that's a sweet thing to do and I mean that it's uh, easy for me to be here and to be here early because it's like so much needs to be done but with all of you who sometimes are preoccupied I'm agreeing that some of you are here 90 plus percent of the time and, uh, and I love that. But for those who have to be uh, off with work or off with kids, as some of our own are here are, are doing so today, when they get back, just say, glad to see you. You know, that's a good way to be. Uh, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be an interesting sermon here. I was not settled on Psalm 1 as a, as a passage to preach until Friday, which is still enough time when you don't have a lot else to do to, to see what God's got. In Psalm 1 but I want us to begin after I drink this water by giving thanks for 2023 how about that we should and here's why uh, New Year's on the mind it ought to be on your mind we're heading into it fast we're seeing old deck the halls with boughs of holly fast away the old year passes follow la, 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 la. that's about the only you know that one and uh, wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year otherwise we run right up on this holiday after we've packed up our tree perhaps or maybe you don't pack up your tree until a week or two away from now like I wish we did but I respect that we get busy here in a few days but nonetheless it gets right to you and you're thinking wow 2023 is over done we were just getting over the big brutal winter freeze of Christmas 2022 heading into 2023 on the New Year's day then I can't tell you the last New Year's I stayed up till midnight. When my children want to do that, we will do that. But they don't want to do that. And I don't want them to do that. We don't do that. But if you're up till midnight, you might recall the last New Year's and the way you spent it. And we get right up to this, and it's a really interesting time to have a couple of biblical and spiritual uh, reflections and commitments that we set before us. And one is the principle of gratitude, and that's giving thanks for 2023. So, I notice in Acts 17, 28, it's not going to be there, but just hear it quickly. Paul quotes a secular source, but he applies the source to Christians. He says, or to, to all people, really, but he applies it as a Christian to all people. In take, talking of God, he says, in him we live and move and have our being. And that was your 2023. Believe it. Every breath up until the last one that you take in 2023 is of God. It's a gift. <coughs> Jesus said, and I believe that he means this to apply to the basics of life, all the way from just the body functioning to the, the works that we might do for him that we think, God, I'm serving you now. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I said that in John chapter 15, speaking of the true vine and the branches. So in 2023, if you lived and moved and had your being, and you did anything, you did it in the Lord. You did it in Jesus. And your 2023 had some things, and I was with some of y'all for some of it, 
It has some things that were hard, that hurt. You might have seen it coming or you might not have. And for others of you, you had an experience, most, for the most part in 2023, you can look back and you can say, pretty fair and square. Maybe not too far out of the ordinary, about par for the course. If you put this year on the scales, it kind of balances out. Others of you may have had a fantastic year. We may have had a mixture of all the things I've just described. You know, on January 10th of 2023, my wife called from a routine doctor's appointment and said that she is pregnant. And it, the whole year got swallowed up in being Elizabeth's year. That was it. Getting Millie as ready as we could to be with the sister trying to get other things ready for this baby to arrive. And then she comes along July 21st and one kid is one kid, two kids is two kids. They've said three kids is 15, so we don't know about a third. So there you have it. But that's it. So it was Elizabeth's year. And I give thanks to God for that. I give thanks to God for every interaction I had with all of you, with others, with family, for every day that was well lived and for everything I was ready to get over with that finally got over with I give thanks to God for being right alongside and right in there to carry me through and you should do the same so do that now I want to talk about having a happy new year a happy new year you may like having the song on the page in front of you because I noticed and I appreciate the layout that we have there but it's not as poetically broken up and so, you know, the Psalms have line, indent, line, indent. You might like seeing that better. But really, Psalm 1 is a psalm that will help us to have. I, I think if we could just apply some things here, we really have a framework to pin much of God's word onto. And we learn how to have a happy new year. Donald read it to us. I want you to notice the first word of the psalm is blessed. 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 In other Bible translations that want to modernize it, that's fine to do that. This is a, kind of keeping it a bit traditional. Blessed can be translated as happy. Happy. And the word carries out this meaning joyful, glad, smiling. If you think about blessed, from, from man to man in the scriptures, Sometimes it can seem like kind of a spiritual pat on the back or a spiritual high five, and that's probably appropriate sometimes. But I want you to get the idea that blessed is the smile of God upon your life. And it's something that you can sense and you can walk in and you can share. How do I know that? Where does Jesus begin teaching in the Sermon on the Mount? And I think that's a sermon that he preached routinely. Wherever he would go, he would have a new crowd. You've got to realize they couldn't all live stream Jesus. So he would go to one village and he would teach the crowds. He began with blessed are the, fill in the blank, poor in spirit, the meek, those who hunger for righteousness, the pure in heart, peacemakers. And then he would give reasons. And so Jesus has it as his first priority. You understand <coughs> God will show you how to be blessed, to live with his gladness evident upon you. Sometimes in my biblical studies, it can get a little bit heady and you start to parse out a word and you start to try to really dig in and understand how it's used across the scripture. And really what I found as I studied this out is being blessed literally just is being glad in the Lord being glad in God. We often have a good thing happen and we say, well, I'm blessed now. I can tell you honestly, with, with our girls being born and we love them and we've had very few issues as far as health or anything like that. Had a bit of a scare there with Elizabeth. You remember that? Somebody smelled maple syrup and thought it was my kid and thought that we, we had some sort of one in a million problem. And I'm looking at her and I said, that's the healthiest baby you've ever looked at. Sent her down to UAB and sure enough down there, said, that's the healthiest baby we've ever seen in the NICU. I'm going to tell you what, we were blessed to even come out of that experience and learn something. We were blessed to receive our girls. We were blessed to carry them home. But you don't have to hold things in your hand particularly to feel very blessed. You do not have to measure up what 
American society says amounts for riches and wealth and honor. Because have you found out that people get those things and they still aren't necessarily satisfied? So blessing from God has to do with the inner being satisfied and glad in the presence, in the care, in the providence, in the purposes of God. And there are going to be some key ways we look at getting a hold of that. But when you think about this prayer, and, and I pray this, at, I mean, probably at some point every week, I just give this to my, my kids. Number 6, 24 through 26, is the prayer of the priest Aaron, the uh, first priest to the for the people of Israel. And he says, the Lord bless you and keep you. And then I think he basically repeats the same thing, only expanded, because he says, the Lord make his face to shine upon you bless and be gracious to you and I think he repeats it again only in other words the Lord lift up his countenance upon you bless and give you peace and that's a simple prayer that's three verses in the Bible you can memorize that and share it with all kinds of people but we go to Psalm chapter 1 and we get a couple of directives of how to really I believe walk in step with God's will for the believer, this is a sermon to you believers. If anybody's in here and they're not a believer, you can come on into this. Doors open. But this is a sermon where I'm assuming that you want to consider God's will and how He will be showing His bright countenance to you in the blessed way of living. With the first word being blessed, I want to point out to you that to walk in blessing, there must be some distance from evil there must be in your life distance from evil how so because it has three negatives nor not nor blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked and I like that because really what happens is it introduces blessing as a as a thing to desire in contrast to temptation so watch the way that Sin and evil slow you down. Walks not in the counsel of the wicked, so you can begin by taking advice from those who are opposed to God. And this is not, by the way, having friends who are non-believers and maybe family members you love and you're reaching out to them. This is this is allowing their un and, and non-believers are going to bring out ungodly aspects from time to time. Even Christians can give bad counsel. Got to watch it, but. This is not allowing those you would love to influence to influence you negatively. So walking not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So walking, standing, sitting, that's the slowdown of sin. And it says you are blessed when you are not that. And you need to understand it. Many people hear the Bible and they say, that's a book of a bunch of thou shalt nots. They've probably read the Ten Commandments before. Many, many people who don't believe in Christ or at least maybe understood some of the Ten Commandments. And eight of the Ten Commandments are don't do something. Right? It begins. I have no other gods besides me. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Do not make an idol. And then you get, you get two positives. Keep the Sabbath and honor your father and mother. But eight of them are framed in a thou shalt not. So God doesn't mind giving you a divine and holy no. But his no is a doorway to his better yes. And that's what these negatives are. As we're going to see in a minute, that instead of taking the, the advice of evil ones, sinners, and we want to reach sinners, but we can't let sinners become our influencers. We can't let them become our best company. Instead of doing that, we keep distance from evil positively. We delight in the word. We delight in the word. And that's it. This is where I've got to hit the kind of kind of try to hit the best for you. Delighting in the word is perhaps one of the main things. You talk about fundamentals in sports, you talk about fundamentals at work, you talk about fundamentals in life. This is a fundamental for your soul. Delight in the word. I'm gonna iron this out for you. In the year 2024, God will help me. Uh, I read the I did read the entire Bible through in 2023. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I was reading to read. 
That was just what I was doing. I opened up the Word and I had two or three places I knew my Bible reading plan guided me to that day. It was probably where I left off. And there were times where, because of something else going on, I was a little bit pat, not quite as passionate about what I was seeing. But here it doesn't simply say who reads the law of the Lord. And by the way, that's the whole Bible the psalm writer has. The law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as he speaks of it. We have Alpha to Omega. We have the Genesis to the Revelation. We have the whole counsel of God, as Paul frames it in the book of Acts. So we have something so much more to delight in. We have the fulfillment and the realization of Genesis to Deuteronomy in Jesus Christ. And he says, delight in, in the law of the Lord. We can just take that as people today and we can pin right there on the law of the Lord. Delight in the whole word of God. Delight in that. And how do I do that is a great question. Well, I, I'll tell you this. I have in the front cover of my Bible today a Bible reading plan. It's different than the one I used last year. I think it's a little bit simpler. Part of my hardship last year is I had one that had so many different places it scheduled to read. This one just gives me a general guide and I can kind of go as I go. Although it does say to keep track, do this many chapters a day or whatever. The goal is not to end the year with, with a mark over each of these chapter numbers. That's not necessarily the goal. That's fine when that happens. Lord willing, it will. But the goal is to treasure and glory in and rejoice in the word of God. It really is. And that can take you a little while. That's something that if you do this more and more and more, it's analogous to running. Maybe the first time somebody gets up to read the Bible, they could be struck with holy curiosity. And they're carried from page to page or cover to cover. But some may not be a natural reader. That's okay. God's made some of us who like to get to it with our hands and less to it with our eyes and our mind. But if you are a believer in Christ, you're called to be a man or woman of the book. And so some read through the Bible and they go, whew, that's tough. You know, honestly, here's how it goes. We read all the way up to about the middle of Exodus. And once he starts getting instructions about how to make that big tabernacle tent, we get kind of tired of seeing and this many purple, uh, you know, linen cloths are going to go here and bind them together with these clasps. And you're just wanting somebody to illustrate this for you. And you're thinking, what am I doing? And then you turn from Exodus. Does it get any better? Well, you don't think so because you just opened up Leviticus. And now you're hung up on this many sayers of fine flour going up to the altar with the pigeon if you're poor and the goat if you got some money. And you're reading this again and again. And what happens when this guy knocks off this dude's animal or these two get in a fight and he knocks out his tooth? And here, here's the thing. I find that the more I learn in general, and I'll let you be a lifelong learner. It's the day you cease to learn is the day you begun to die. But the more I'm a lifelong learner and I carry the fact of law in general, I go back to God's law and I see there right there is a picture of a merciful God arranging a society where people can function in it. Why does he say eye for eye? Because one guy was doing life for eye. Scale it back down. Make it proportional. Why does he say that it must be a, a bride price for this or that or the other? You can't sin against the man's daughter and have no consequence. So you start to read these things in Leviticus. And if you know a bit about human nature and if you get your doctrine straightened out and you understand the miracle that God has said anything in the first place to us, then we can actually read through the hard parts of the Bible and go, huh. And we are in the most resource-rich time to be alive as a Christian, which gets me to the next point, delighting in the Bible. This plan is not called, first of all, a Bible delighting plan. Delighting in the Bible really comes down at root to an attitude of humility and gratitude for the Bible. Because if I come to this word and I say, God, never in all of my days will I master this book. Never in all of my days will I come to the end of things here that are so rich and so profound for me. No matter what righteous angle I study it from this time, I will never reach the bottom of the ocean that is truth and grace given here. And then you can also say, God, I am not even worthy of the chance to do it. Have you ever just walked away from, from studying scripture and say, I didn't deserve it, but I'm glad I got it. That'll change a lot. And maybe you start that way and you say, God, 
I'm not here today because you're congratulating me for being really awesome. I'm here today because you revealed yourself to me and your son, Jesus Christ. And I love him and I want more of him. And that was your plan and not mine. You sent him. I would be looking for somebody else. But you've been very gracious and kind. And you've given us the greatest gift we could have ever asked for. And the reason I open Genesis or Leviticus or Isaiah or the Proverbs is not just because, oh, ah, here's some interesting stuff. It's because Jesus is compelling me. Didn't he say on the road to Emmaus that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he spoke to them of the things in the scriptures concerning him. And so the whole thing is getting us to him, showing him to us, applying what he has done to our lives, showing what is yet to come, showing what he can still do. And he is mighty. And he is good. And he is close. So uh, there we go. Delight in the Bible through humility and gratitude. But I'm going to pretty much put it to you. If you don't have a plan to start with, you don't have a plan. You don't have a plan. So I'm a guy who likes a plan. I kind of liken it to building a house. If you gave me the tools to build a house and actually had the wherewithal to do it, I would be pretty messed up without a blueprint. I would need something that shows me the measurements from one room to the other to the other, where to leave space so that the electrical can come through here and so on and so forth, and the appliances can come here. What kind of joints in the wall and joists matter? How, how does all this deal? How, how, do, how do I support the, the whole structure? I would need to know that. I do like having a simple plan that tells me, get started here and just keep going. And that's just me. I'm going to email you some Bible reading plans, as a matter of fact, so you check it out. So we delight in the word, and then we dwell on the word. Now, I've taken a long time on the first half of this, this song, so we're going to have to, I planned on not taking years much time on the last half, but dear, we need this. Dwell on the word. On his law, he meditates day and night distance from evil influences. Mark who those are, by the way. Um, and here's the thing. It doesn't mean we go Amish and never have contact with the outside world or with non-believers or anything. We definitely want friendships and connections and relationships out there. Always to be the Christian that they need to know. Because many people need to trust a Christian before they trust Christ. But we also have to be, we have to understand what Romans 12 says not to be conformed to the world and its pattern, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's where the positive is, is at. The renewal of the mind, we can delight in the word, but you meditate on it day and night. The brain, people say, the brain, people say, is really more complex than any planet in the universe could be compared to. It may seem hard to understand. I was reading something today that had to do with learning how to better comprehend what you're reading. And I felt like that was probably good for me because sometimes I get kind of daydreaming while I read. But the author said the brain is more complex than even the most complex of the planets in orbit. That tells me that God has given us a tool to begin to mull things over, to think things through, to put things to work. And so the word meditate, I believe it makes your mind as God planned for it a conduit, an avenue to your heart and your soul so that then the changes that he is working can flow through there. I was getting into Romans 12, and that was 1 through 2. It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What is this meditate? We do the word meditate, and we might be concerned if you came into church and you heard your friend say, I meditated a good while yesterday. This is probably thinking of somebody doing something yoga-like or monk-like, humming your mind empty. That's what a lot of people mean when they say meditate. The word in Hebrew speaks of something a little awkward to discuss, but it speaks of muttering as if chewing. You ever had food so good? And I know none of you ladies ever do this. You're real proper when you eat. But you take guys, and they're not trying to impress nobody, and you put barbecue ribs or brisket. You just, you just butcher an animal spice it up and smoke it and you let guys eat it chicken wings they're going to grunt while they do it you do that and for the sports fans you put it right they're going to talk right through it 
animals that chew their cud back, you can often hear them grunting and muttering. And really, that's the root word of the Hebrew is to kind of mutter and to, to coo while you chew things or work things over. To ponder, to groan. So if the mind is groaning over things, muttering over things, thinking things through, what's happening in that instance is we are not just merely picking things up. Oh, I just read scripture and I'm good to go. We are processing it. We are comparing scripture to our life, scripture to our trials, scripture to our joys, scripture to scripture. You can, I, I can ponder across the whole Bible. I can ponder across a chapter. I can ponder across a book. I can ponder across a single verse. I can ponder, I can meditate upon a single word, but you are filling your mind for the purpose of obedience to God purpose of love for God and others. i got to tie everything I'm saying. What did Jesus say is the greatest of the commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So everything that we do purposefully with Scripture, we should be asking the question, where does this go out of me and into somebody else? How do I put this in play? Some Scriptures are tough to do that with. You read the book of Job, unless you're really going through it in life or you know somebody who also is, you might not necessarily know how to put some of that in play, but you can see that God is greater than we ever fathom. And now you're carrying the greatness of the great God principally in your mind, into your relationships, in your friendship. I'm going to go into the book of James. I find very practical things in there. Uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Uh, I find that we ought to be a particular people when it comes to taming the tongue and watching what we say. So some scriptures kind of meet you in the streets. You go to the book of Proverbs. Some people love to read Proverbs every day. It's a good idea. You can find something you can immediately jump to and, and carry with you. But in all of it, however worshipful it makes you toward the Lord or however handy it makes you and gracious toward others, get with this next verse in the psalm. As you're dwelling on the word, you're developing deep roots. And here's the description of the blessed life. To have a happy life, Delighting in the word, dwelling on it, develop deep roots. It says he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. Now the contrast starts and picks up and you can see that's actually verse four where it begins, the wicked are not so, or like the chaff that the wind drives away. But let's understand something about this. Like a tree planted by streams of water. Oftentimes I've gone fishing out there, usually with, uh, with my father. We fish in a little John boat with a tiller, with a hand-operated tiller motor most of the time. Dad's real minimalist when it comes to his fun and games. So, you know, we, we transitioned from that to a boat that actually had steering wheel, and we felt like we were in high cotton. It was still a John boat. But we would oftentimes find that the, the trees along the riverbank and along these uh, tributaries into the Tennessee River, they are quite often a good bit thicker toward the bank than some of the trees out off the bank, 10 feet, 20 feet off. And you can see the root system of the trees as sometimes the water just washed a little bit of the surface away. You can see the root system of some of these trees. Now, I'm not talking about where you can get off on the bank and the shoreline and walk it. I'm talking about where it really runs right up to the edge. And you can't hardly step out onto it. It's almost like a, a bit of an overhang cliff. But they're running down and these trees will just they're, they're drinking up abundant sunlight because they're on the edge of the forest and they've got their, they're out there by the streams of water. And I get the image in my mind and I think if every tree were like that, they would, I mean, they would just be massive, be enormous. And the notion is that just as Jesus said that whoever believes in me from him, from his heart will flow rivers of living water, John 7, 38. Who's supplying the living water? It's God. And so if you're delighting in the word, you're dwelling on the word, then you are in line to get the streams of living water that come from it. And then now what are you doing? You develop deep roots and you're bearing good fruit. It says that his fruit is in season. What are we going to do with that description? Do you ever have someone you come up and you realize they need me to really help them right now? Something has happened. They've taken a, they, they, they've had a loss. They've taken a hit. They're hurting. You yield fruit in season. Did not Jesus say, when you visit all of these who are in such a bad way, 
the poor, the imprisoned, the sick. As you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So bearing fruit in season has to do with understanding the seasons that come to various people in life that God has appointed for you to serve and for you to care for. Now, that means that we ought to be watching each other for how we can help. So you've done so great at that in recent times. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it. There's probably not a single moment in the day when you're with somebody, even when you're away from people and you're on your own, where you should not be bearing fruit in season. Because it says in all that he does, he prospers. Now, when I read that verse and I encounter a Christian who fell upon a hard time and it had nothing to do with what he did, what am I supposed to say about that? Let's say he was part of a major layoff at his job. Let's say that he was like some of our brothers and sisters who've been targeted by state governments for their convictions in the workplace. What do I say? I say the same thing the verse says. Somehow, even if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil for God is with you. You can prosper in the Lord and of the Lord. By the way, if, if, if your prospering looks like you have a lot materially to share with other people, you get to do just that. If your prospering means that you have particular gifts that you have discerned that are of God, you get, to, you get to find a way to put those to work. That's just the way it is. But it says in all that he does, things can be done to us. Things can happen that are done around us. But however it is that we go, whether the path is quite bright or whether the way seems unsure, in the Lord, in his will, in his pleasure, in his purposes, in being the person that Christ transforms you to be, there you can thrive. Now we get to the last part. You have a happy new year, a blessed life, by remembering that if this is true for you, then you are destined for life. What you delight in always matches uh, the destiny, okay? And here's the way it it, it comes to this. It says, The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. And then we get a rather severe saying, but we better hear it. It says in verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. It is the way, quite frankly, that he calls you to live. It's the way that he makes it is not just merely that the righteous have come up with it. It is rather that he shows it to the righteous. But the way of the wicked, which is the way of willful ignorance and rejection and refusal of God, the way of the wicked will perish. Isn't it striking that the first word in the, in the psalm is blessed? The last word in the psalm is perish. It's almost like God has, in this psalm, really put two different roads in front of you. And he says, here's the road that says, blessed are you. Distance from evil, delighting in the word, develop the deep roots, dwelling on the word. Now what you delight in determines where you're headed. So you want to you know that in the Lord you're destined for life? How do you prove that? Go back to where we've just been. And those things be true for you. It's not work salvation. It's just obedience to the will of God. It doesn't gain you any grace. That wasn't yours when you were justified through faith in Christ. But rather it's the act of walking in what God has called you to walk into. Now the wicked are not so, but are like the chaff. That tells me that, that where the tree is secure, the chaff is unstable. The chaff blows away. What's the wind? I believe it could actually be a reference to the spirit itself. Why? Because it's Hebrew ruah. Same root meaning. Spirit, wind, breath. Chaff that the wind drives away. It appears to be attached to the wheat, but then you just you just uh, thresh it a little bit or the wind comes along and it's gone. And so there is a judgment coming and verse five speaks of that. And the wicked, it says, will not stand, meaning they will not last through the entirety of it in the judgment. Jesus has framed the judgment as a separation of the sheep from the goats. Paul says in Philippians chapter two, 
that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. What's the congregation of the righteous? In some ways, it's true that if the congregation of the righteous, I should call it Christians gathered together, okay? It's, in some ways, it's true that if somebody willfully persists in just walking as a sinner with impunity, with a high hand, they're not going to want to stay for long in the congregation of the righteous. You can do everything you can do to open the door for them and help them. You can put the bread right in front of them, but you can't force their mouth open and tell them to take a bite. You're just praying to the Lord. And you pray, pray wholeheartedly. So it could mean that in real life that's true. Those who persist in non-belief will not stay around. But the congregation of the righteous could also very well refer to eternity. I think I honestly take it as referring to both. And remember, how are we secure in this life? How, do we, how are we blessed knowing this? The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Pastor, how can I know the way of the righteous like the Lord does? Read verses 1 through 3. <laughs> how do you like that? You want to find the way of the righteous? He gave it to you at the start of the psalm. He said, here it is. You go for this and you walk in this. And guess what? You're not going to want to do this anyway if you are if you are in Christ, if you are not believing in Christ, if you do not have the Spirit, you're not going to want to do that anyway. You can try for a little bit. But Jesus said that there is going to be four different kinds of soil that take the seed, right? In the parable of the sower. Some of it's shallow. Some of it's the rocky soil. Some of it has the thorns and thistles. But then there's the good soil. You get worried. You say, I want to know the way of the righteous that the Lord knows. Oh, he's already told you. You know how I plan on walking in the way of the righteous? God, help me. I, I, I want to do it. And, and I don't do anything without his strength. I don't. I don't get to wake up and say, I did good yesterday. I wake up and I say, God, I need thee every hour. Now, here's what I do. Delight in, dwell upon, and get deep roots from here. Do it. You have a happy new year. That's a good thing to say to somebody. Happy new year. Just say it. You really mean it. You want to have a happy new year. Do you mean what we just read? If you want God to guide you into a blessed new year, if you haven't been doing any of the things I've been preaching about, or you've been kind of off on any of it, he's put an invitation in front of you today. He has. And if you have been in this, God bless you. Way to go. Glory to God. Keep going. That's what I got. So, as I closed out, I said the psalm puts before us two ways to live. Remember that? This is not all about just having our lounge chair time with Jesus. If it's that way, then we need a lot of help. Because to be honest with you, there are plenty of people, and if we open up the doors, some of them could probably hear us preaching in here. We're not going to delight in the law of the Lord and not going to dwell on it. And there are a lot of reasons why. Maybe they think they've tried the real thing and they just didn't find it satisfying. They tried church. They tried uh, believing. They, you know, some will say all kinds of things. Ultimately, it's, it's this. Anything short of surrender through repentance and casting your faith upon Jesus Christ alone is going to keep you in the second of those categories, the way that perishes. So you can frame it around a whole lot of things. But I believe that the world that is still in that mode, because of what Scripture is, and because of who God is, I believe the world has every right to expect that if we read this book and we call upon Christ's name, we're going to be reaching for something authentic. We're going to be reaching for something true. We're going to have something given. And don't criticize your brothers and sisters when it looks a little bit different in their lives. When they've got their hands involved over here or over there or this way or that way. And remember, everybody is a bit, is a bit differently alone. You've got a three-year-old here today You've got everybody in between the ages of, Lord help me, all the way up to 89, 33. The same applies spiritually. 
all the different points. Some of us strong and mature, and some are the newcomers, and some are somewhere in the middle. We owe it to the world, we owe it to the Lord, we owe it to each other to grasp for something authentic and true. I pray that we're doing that because that's the way of blessing. So let's have a word of prayer together now. God Almighty, I lift up to you these people who, with me, heard this. I heard this. Yeah, I might have been talking, but I heard this. And I pray, Father, that the hearers today might just simply uh, go with, with the uh, thought that blessing awaits. And it's in delighting and dwelling upon and getting the deep roots in Scripture, in the Word, in you. I honestly believe, Lord, that if, that if we... If we could humble ourselves and grasp it rightly, we, we would just need to accept that Jesus has thought it better to show us himself through whole scripture as opposed to continuing to walk about among us visibly, physically. Because through what scripture does, I believe you want to make more of Jesus visible to each other. Christian little Christ. Lord, I am powerless to move my own heart. I need what you give. These people do too. And help us to come and ask for it. To ask for the passion and the desire to delight in the word and to have the roots deep enough to where we have something to share with others. And help us not to lose our compassion and our concern and our care for the lost. Help us to be a church that's ready to embrace them, share Christ with them, and see him lifted high in their life as well. Friends, I want to just put it to you. If anything that I've mentioned today strikes you as a point of need, we have people here, myself, others, who are available to pray with you and spend time with you and understand just what you might bringing in to be bringing to church today. If you have any concern and you might want to know that you belong by grace, God's grace, through faith, trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, to Christ. You want to know that you are a believer in Christ. You want to know how to be a believer in Christ. You want to have any question related to that answered. Please, please reach out. There's no shame. There's no joy in hiding it. There's no joy in delaying. There's no promise of tomorrow. Talk about 2024, but it's not here yet. The Lord could come in 2023. Where will you be? Friends, if you're here and you're a believer and you don't want to be lukewarm in this year, you just consecrate yourself to God. Would you ask Him for the help that you need, divine strength, power from on high, to live out what you've heard today and to go beyond it, as I pray you do. I pray you start going beyond it tonight and tomorrow, and living what you've heard in ways that are personal and true or do his word in your own life. Father, we dedicate to you just the desire of our hearts, and I pray that we grow stronger all the more. And I ask you, Father, that you would providentially put us in the places where people who just don't have the saving knowledge and love of Jesus Christ will be right there with us. And also put us among Christians who can strengthen us. We need to be looking in both directions. Help our church, Lord, to be truly a church. I love each people. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to give a, a comment real quickly. Uh, by the way, there is no coffee next door for you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> or donuts. It's a hard way to put it. But uh, Donald uh, is sort of, sort of like a hanging, low, lay low kind of Sunday, right? Anyway, but uh, thank you all for coming early. The, uh, we're on for Sunday school next week. We're on for Wednesday night this week. And I want to thank Ron for coming in. Hey, he's a, 
He's going to have a retirement reception, aren't you? Coming up. Are you? And the February. Yes. And you did 22 years with Madison Baptist Association. Big, big uh, span of service right there. And so um, we're thankful. He just, he just showed up. And so uh, pleasure to see you in God's house today. And to also kind of relay back to that good night we had at, what was it, Chewy's? Mm -hmm. So we all had a dinner together. That was good. Now, um, if you need anything, you know, I invited you for prayer and all that. Just grab my attention. Grab somebody in here you trust. Uh, if you don't know who to trust, I trust just about anybody here. So go for it. And if they don't know what to do, they'll come find somebody. But you say, hey, the Lord is moving me this way. I want some help. Um, past that, uh, um, something to mention. David, when are you headed out for Alaska? Actually, I'm leaving for Alaska Sunday morning, but we're going down to, uh, I'm going to Canada for her work and spend a week here. So I'm going to fly out there and start I sure hate that they make her work in Cocoa Beach. Who could ever put somebody in? I sure, I sure regret that they put you in the water. <laughs> yeah, well, Addison said y'all been below the charge. Yeah. All right. So um, you won't be here next Sunday? I'll be out next Sunday. All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer for David. All right. Father, I put, lift up to you, uh, David, Andrea, and Addison, I praise you for their, for their commitment to missions. And I lift up to you the work in Alaska that he's going to do. And I uh, would ask God that, that you just uh, give, give him everything, clear health, clear mind, perfect travel, all that needs to happen to get him there, and uh, great, great connections for service and evangelism with the people who are going to be there uh, doing with the race. And God, I pray that they see that the Christians have shown up to serve and to care. We, we ain't turning people into projects. We genuinely love every heart and soul. Make it a genuine God. He's such a genuine servant. Thank you for that. Uh, help him, Lord, with this new role that he's entered into with Alaska Missions to see everything just in place to do it without worry, without fear of how it would go in the future, but with full confidence that he is right where he needs to be. I thank you, Lord, for Andrea, and I pray, Father, as often as she can connect with Alaska Missions, I know that she loves him and supports him, and that she has... I don't see how she could not, but she has a great time working in the places that she's headed for. And for Addison to be uh, blessed by spending so much time with this uh, loving, grateful God. Thank you, Lord, in Christ I pray. Amen. Uh, that's all I got. We can sing a song in closing, uh, I guess. Um, it's a good New Year's song. Let's just close back with what we sang earlier. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. No, I promise you. You don't have to feed it. You can't feed it. If she found a way to feed it, you let me know and I can sit here and make it. You know, it you'll like it. I'm not going to buck the blood you try. I thought y'all were going to be here. I don't know. I don't know.